This is WBAA. I'm Mike Lowitzo. Purdue University Press is releasing a new book, The Jewish Jesus, Revelation, Reflection, Reclamation. It's a compilation of articles and essays edited by Zev Garber, who's an emeritus professor and chair of Jewish Studies and Philosophy at Los Angeles Valley College. Also, Zev is co-editor of Shofar, an interdisciplinary journal of Jewish studies published by Purdue Press. He joins me in the studio. Thanks so much for coming in today. Thank you for having me. So as I said, The Jewish Jesus is a collection of essays and articles, and it's related to the understanding that Jesus is Jewish, but also the center of the Christian faith. Why did you decide to make that connection the focus of a book? Well, the origin, the uh, the nexus of this whole project came several years ago. <clears throat> One of my credits for Purdue is I co-edited a journal called Shofar, we do a wonderful job of book reviewing, and a book came across uh, came across my desk, and I decided to review it myself, which dealt with the Jewish Jesus, written by a colleague of mine, Amy Jo Levine, who is a professor of New Testament studies at Vanderbilt University. What is unusual is not New Testament studies, but what is unusual is to have a Jewish professor in charge of that class. What makes it doubly unusual is that she's a practicing Orthodox Jew. I happen to relate to that, both on the level of practice of Judaism and also curiosity about New Testament. The book was reviewed by me. It got high marks, and there was one issue that disturbed me, and as a result became the idea that eventually morphed into the book. Professor Amy Jo Levine referred to Jesus as a prophet in Judaism. The word prophet is Judaism's saintly term, The prophet of prophets in Jewish tradition is Moses, our teacher. Our teacher is a rabbinic term associated with the biblical Moses. And to have the title of prophet by Jesus, admittedly not son of God or God, which is a divine incarnate title from Christianity, was a term that caught me by surprise. Equally important, a term rabbi Jesus catches me by surprise as well, because Historically speaking, the term rabbi never existed in the historical period of Jesus. It's a term that's post-70, a term we normally use with destruction of the Second Temple. And from that period on, the title rabbi emerges. So Jesus said to live before 70, called Rabbi Jesus, which is a term used today by Christian scholars. Needless to say, teacher I can handle, prophet I cannot. And so I took issue with that and basically acknowledge here are two practicing Jews who see the significance of Jesus in what is referred to as Second Temple Judaism. That whole period is called Second Temple Judaism from a Jewish chronicle point of view. And I take issue with the prophetic part. The reason is a prophetic word has to be fulfilled in the lifetime of a generation that hears it, which is based on a Torah injunction. I have no doubts about the sincerity of Jesus, the loyalty, his nationalism, which is how I see Jesus, but the very fact that the words of the redemption of his people in the land of Israel under Roman oppression, who has not realized in his lifetime, would make him, if called a prophet, a false prophet. So my hidden agenda is really in favor of Christianity. I don't want Jesus to be known by Jews as a false prophet. I cannot see him referred to as a prophet as his words are not fulfilled. And maybe, just maybe, Mike, that's behind the words on the cross. My God, my God, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabatani, why did you forsake me? Why did you not let me fulfill that role, quote, of being a prophet? I ended in typical Christian German terms by saying, was sagen Jesus? What would Jesus say about my criticism of referring to him as a prophet? That's how it started. It eventually led to an invitation by Case Western Reserve University where in 2005, I was the invited Rosenthal professor. I suggested to Peter Haas, the chairperson of the Jewish Studies Center there, to sponsor, if it's, if it's within his means, a symposium on Jesus, and we did. And the actual symposium name is Jesus in the Context of Judaism and the Challenge, the Challenge to Christianity, suggesting the more Jewish you go with Jesus, the more disturbing it probably will be for ecclesiastical Christians. By that, I mean church-going Christians. So a symposium was held. We ran a special issue of Shofar on the papers. And from those papers, edited for a book with additional contributions, we produced the book that's launched today, April 12th, the year of our Lord, 2011. Talk about this symposium. 
what was some of the discussion? What was some of the, uh, I guess, debate that came out of that? The symposium itself, the original one, had maybe five or six contributors. And I gave the plenary and basically raised issues about the Jewish Jesus, how valid is it in the Christological imaging of Jesus? By that I mean Jesus seen through the Christ of faith. My question is not an original one. It's as old as the whole quest for Jesus, which is the academic term for the questing of the historical Jesus, which has gone through different phases, and we're now in phase number four, I might add, which is what we're doing and what we have led with, which is the Jewishness of Jesus. The original phase began in the early 20th century with Albert Schweitzer's incredible book called In the Quest of the Historical Jesus. In any case, um, the points I was raising was basically if one considers Jesus as a historical figure, and if one understands the doctrine of the church, the incarnation of Christ, which means Jesus as truly human, truly man among men, this type of thing, then the designated title would be a practicing Jew, which the New Testament seems to subscribe to. There is the famous question, what is the great commandment? And he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He then says that the second of the great commandments is, He probably would have recited it in Hebrew in the original, Love your neighbor as yourself. There are references that clearly indicate that Jesus supports and lives every iota, every dot of the law, using Matthew as my reference right now. With that said, it is no longer the ball in the court of the Christian interpretation. It's now the Judaism, or Judaisms as it's called, of that first century. And that's how it started. I also have a tendency of imagining. I think that's a fair way of looking at historical material, which itself is questionable. My own signature, of which a festriff in my honor, published by Purdue University Press, points out that of all the contributions Zev has made to scholarship, he seems to be a pioneer of what's called historiosophy. Historiosophy is looking at history as a paradigm, not looking at it as objective facts. Why not the latter, which is what scholars do? Because I don't think scholars are honest. Anytime you look at something, it's interpreted. Anything you see is interpreted. Even within your own mindset, within the day, it gets reinterpreted. So I'd rather be honest. I interpret everything. And I'd rather say that something that's significant knows no time or space. It is eternal. Hence the term, a paradigm. So for me, the quest of the historical Jesus is paradigmatic. And it includes Christian belief. Christianity instructs me that there'll be a second coming of the Christ. I have no problems in acknowledging that paradigm. The difference is, and this is where the question you're asking comes in, on that Sunday evening, I imagine a returning Christ. I imagine him coming to the ashes of Auschwitz. I, imagining, I imagine him telling his people, many those who call him by his name, and saying to them, what have you done? What have you done to my children, Israel? That's the impact. In the background is a Mark Chagall, which has the famous crucifixion with a Jesus and his loincloth being a prayer shawl. And in the background are the burning shtetlach, the burning burials of Jewish communities burnt because the Jews killed Christ our Lord or sentiments that caused that type of pogrom. And that's how I see it. And the reaction was very swift. People had different aspects of how to deal with Jesus including a Roman Catholic spokesperson of tremendous importance, Jean Fisher, who um, had certain chutzpah, audacity, by presenting a paper, How Jews Misunderstand Jesus, and presented a Catholic perspective of Jewish restrictions in understanding the Christological incarnate Christ of Roman Catholic tradition, which is just the way we need it. So we had different viewpoints, and that led to invitations to others and what the book presents is the intent is not just simply scholars reading a scholarly uh, manuscript, but for classroom usage. Show for Supplements, a series which I founded and endorsed by Charles, is um, are books of this nature meant for the classroom and instruction. How is that brought about? In our book, after each chapter, there are questions, questions for discussion. There's an annotated bibliography, and there are defined scholarship that's found therein. Do you think this is going to cause controversy 
in in and maybe even hatred or 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 more anti-semitism no no it's not going to cause more anti-semitism it's not going to cause hatred what it's going to cause and this i'm concerned about is a readjustment of christianity particularly in its ideological understanding of jews and let me explain two days ago i was part of a symposium at the western states jewish studies association meeting at san diego it was at the two o'clock hour of this past Sunday where I, Jim Moore, who is Valparaiso University Lutheran, Steve Jacobs, who teaches at the University of Alabama, and the session was chaired by Deborah by Rebecca Moore, who is the head of the Religious Studies Department, and a Methodist Christian. So we had two Christians and two Jews in this discussion. Zev Garber gave a paper called Reversal of Triumphalism or Reverse Triumphalism. And I began with a sentiment I shared a number of years ago, and in that audience was Elie Wiesel, among others, at the University of Southern Florida, where the Scholars Conference on the Holocaust and Churches met. Elie Wiesel is the plenary chair of that group. He happened to be part of the symposium where I gave one of the addresses. I paraphrased the prophet Jeremiah, and the prophet, in his words, would say, did say, I curse the day, I curse the day I was born. Jeremiah, who is seen in biblical tradition as the prophet of the exile, his mission, if you call it that, was to talk about the exile and destruction of the second, first temple of the Jews and the exile of a nation. Ergo, if I'm the messenger, if I'm not around, therefore not born, then that message can't be conveyed. Hence, I curse the day that the message was brought to my father, that a ben Zachar, a male child, was born. Paraphrasing Jeremiah, I said then, and I said Sunday, I curse the day that Christianity goes out of business. How can a person like me say this? Very simply. The more liberal Christianity becomes, the more distance and the more questioning it has become of fundamental Christianity. Christianity, unlike Judaism, is a foundation and religion of faith articles. Judaism has no faith article in its commandment system. It's all you shall do, you shall do, you shall not do. It's behavior. Christianity's authoritative concept is divine faith. The more academic a person gets is what a classroom is all about, the more difficult it is to accept faith articles. And let me give you one case in point. Probably the greatest theologian of liberal Protestantism of the 20th century is Paul Tillich. He is a refugee of Nazi Germany. He settled in this country, professor of, of theology at the University of Chicago Divinity School and all that. An article of Paul Tillich, whom I wrote about, by the way, I once did an article on him, which stays with me, is an article entitled Sign and Symbol. Sign and symbols point to things. A symbol differs from a sign in that it points to and gets involved in what it points to, and it makes points of that nature. Paul Tillich also believes that nothing except God as God is God is ultimate. Anything less than God as God is God is idolatry. Jesus Christ is idolatry. How is that possible from a Christian theologian? The role of Christ is a symbol. It points to, it engages, it brings man to the living God. Once the Christ overtakes the living God and becomes God as God is God, that is Christology, meaning Christ idolatry, and that has to end. And now the bottom line, which disturbs some Christians. The death of Christ at the cross is not due to Jewish leadership. Neither is it done by the Romans, neither is it done by the sins of mankind. God, as God, to be liberated as God, had to kill his son. That is shocking, but not for Paul Tillich. Evangelical Christianity is the only standard bearer in Protestantism which is carrying on the fundamentalism of the Christian teachings. And let me give the answer the way I can give it best. I may be a professor, but I'm first a teacher. I spoke to 180 students in two combined classes just yesterday. At the end of my second presentation, I had a few minutes to discuss with students. No questions came forth. I said, how's my talk? Point to the first student I saw in front of me. She said, I didn't like what you said. Was I hurt by it? No. Was I concerned? Yes. Was I protected? Absolutely. For the first five minutes of a 55-minute lecture, I gave my disclaimer. 
what you're going to hear this hour is going to hurt those of us who are believers. I asked her the nomination. She says she's a Baptist. I said, what was wrong with my presentation? Well, Christ is not a symbol. Christ is God, fully understood. And that's why the Jewish Jesus can be hurtful to some. The irony is, the more evangelical a person is, the hungry he is for the Jewish Jesus that's part of the Lord God of history. I mentioned to Charles that the audience for this book, though it's geared for marketing for students and for academics, is the evangelical community, which will love this book because it deals with the Jewish Jesus, albeit the agenda is the conversion of Jews, which I'm afraid the book will not do. It makes very clear responsibility and sharing. And let me just take another moment because I think you need to hear this. You need to hear this from one who identifies himself as a practicing Jew. I purposely wore my head covering to make sure I'm not a phony in that area. (laughs) I was asked by the copy editor, Diana Gilroy, to write a dedication, and let me read you words. To the courageous and devoted essayists of this tome, Jews of one group of people who contributed, who practice the faith of Jesus, and Christians who believe by faith in Jesus. Mike, a statement like that would never have been said by me 10 years ago. It's said by me today because part of my academic career is dialogue with Christians. I have no problem saying I believe in the faith of Jesus. The Christian says, well, there's a Jewish Christian walking. Not really. Faith of Jesus is not Christianity. It's Judaism. And the Christian responsibility and respect is, by faith in Jesus, they share with me the Jesus concept. There is reconciliation. There is bringing together. There is teshuva, returning, without any mean intent of anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism, and God forbid, bashing Christianity. The book is The Jewish Jesus, Revelation, Reflection, Reclamation. More information is on the Purdue University Press website. It's thepress.purdue.edu. Zev Garber, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you very much for having me. You're listening to WBAA. I'm Mike Lowitzo.